It's once again my pleasure to introduce Zachary Mannheimer, who is Principal Community Planner for McClure Engineering Company in Des Moines, Iowa. Yay, Iowa. After a road trip from New York City to 22 cities, including Little Rock, uh, Zachary chose and settled in Des Moines in the fall of 20, uh, 2007 to found the Des Moines Social Club, an arts and educational nonprofit. And I look forward to his presentation and learning more about creative placemaking, economic de development for a new generation. Zachary has taught and are lectured at Central College and Wagner College and has articles and essays published in the New York Theater Review and American Theater Magazine. And his theatrical work and Des Moines Social Club has been featured in the New York Times, Time Magazine, USA Today, Politico, The Village Voice, The National Journal, and the Des Moines Register. Zachary has directed and or produced over 25 pieces of professional theater and outdoor festivals. Festivals. He has been awarded the 2011 Des Moines Citizen of the Year Award, 40 Under 40 in Des Moines Business Record, 40 Under 40 for the National New Leaders Council, the Iowa Governor's Volunteer Award, and uh, Young Professional of the Year Award in 2009. Quick question, Zachary, are you Gen X? I'm on the cusp. Of? Gen X and We're going to claim you today. As a member of Gen X, we're going to claim you today because this is very impressive and we are the bridge group that make things happen. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, in 2016, Zachary began his new position with the Iowa Business Growth as the Vice President of Creative Placemaking and recently moved to McClure Engineering as their Principal Community Planner. Zachary serves on the boards of various nonprofits, but I find it also very interesting that he co-owns Proof Restaurant, a Mediterranean dinner spot in, in the downtown Gateway District. Let's welcome to the stage Zachary Mannheimer. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having me. I'm proud to claim uh, Gen X this morning. Uh, later today, I'll claim Millennial, and I can go both sides. So that'll work nice. Uh, I am from Iowa, which is not Ohio or Idaho, uh, often confused with those places. Um, but it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've been here once before, uh, 10 years ago, when I went on my trip that I'm going to talk about in a moment. Uh, and I had a great time, and it's really an honor to be back. And uh, thank you for being so hospitable. We had a wonderful uh, dinner last night at Ed's house and uh, really enjoyed myself, and I'm excited today to speak with all of you about creative placemaking. Uh, so this morning, I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about myself and how I got here, and then lead into the work that I'm doing in small communities throughout uh, the Midwest. Uh, but first, to define creative placemaking, how many of you have heard the term before? So, great. Um, so it's been around about 10, 15 years. There's differing levels of who coined the term. A lot of people claim it. Uh, but basically what it boils down to is how do you increase population and economic development in communities through the lens of cultural and entrepreneurial ideas. And largely, creative placemaking has been done mostly in urban areas throughout the country over the last decade or a decade and a half. Only recently is it beginning to be used in rural communities, and that's the work that I do, and I've got several colleagues around the country that we all do that together. So it's a really intriguing time to discover what creative placemaking means in rural, it's still being defined, and I think that we can do all that together. Uh, but first off, uh, even though I am from Iowa now, uh, that's not where I'm originally from. Originally, I'm from the East Coast. I grew up outside Philadelphia, and uh, for 10 years before I came to Iowa, I was in London and New York City, uh, in Brooklyn in particular. In Brooklyn, I ran theater companies and restaurants. Uh, I, when school, I majored in theater and philosophy, the two majors that do not give you a job. Um, so I quickly uh, spent a lot of time in restaurants, as you do. Um, but in New York, I ran theater companies and restaurants. And I quickly realized that the last thing New York needed was another theater or another restaurant. They were doing fine in those departments. I also found that living in Brooklyn, I was completely surrounded by people who thought like I did, dressed like I did, ate like I did, lived like I did all the time. And I felt that that was not a very healthy bubble. I knew there were other places in the country where people had differing opinions than I did. I didn't know who they were. I had never been there before. 
and I wanted to explore that a little bit, and so I knew I wanted to leave New York, but I wasn't sure where I wanted to go. And so I did this ridiculous road trip over the summer of 2007. I drove to 22 cities across the country, including here in Little Rock. I have to confess that I went north first and came back south, and so by the time I got to Little Rock, Little Rock was my third to last city. Uh, I had pretty much made up my mind I was going to move to Des Moines, so I did not give it a fair shot, so that's my fault. Um, but I did have a really wonderful time when I was here. What I was looking for were communities that were roughly half a million in the metro area, population-wise. I wanted a city that had a downtown that needed to be revitalized or going through rev revitalization. Communities that had an issue with attracting and retaining young people. Cities that had an art scene that was burgeoning but not yet established at a national scale and a place that was at least 50-50 politically as I could find. And Des Moines checked all my boxes. And so in the fall of 07, I moved to Des Moines. I didn't know a single person in the state of Iowa. Uh, all my friends and family thought I was nuts. They are correct. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they all said I'd be back within a year. And uh, now I've got a wonderful wife and three kids. And I, apparently, that's what happens when you move to the Midwest. Um, <laughs> so I moved to Des Moines in 07. And the goal was to found the Des Moines Social Club. And the Des Moines Social Club is a nonprofit arts and educational uh, space in downtown Des Moines. Uh, today, the Social Club produces about 800 different events every single evening in every single artistic discipline. It sees a little over 300,000 people a year come through its doors. Uh, here's a list of what's inside uh, the Social Club, and it is in a uh, 1937 Art Deco firehouse that we uh, bought from the city of Des Moines and historically preserved. Just to show you what it looks like, here's the front of it here. Um, and we historically preserved it, put it on the National Registry, used a lot of historic tax credits, new market tax credits, and other things to use it. We'll go into that later. Um, we, had, uh, we, we were lucky enough to convince David Byrne of the Talking Heads to come out and uh, deliver the keynote address at our grand opening, which was wonderful. Um, inside is the culinary program. We've got the Viaduct Gallery art program. Uh, we have a coffee shop and comic book store, which is one of our for-profit tenants in the space. Uh, we have a robust after-school program and education program in the space. Uh, we do an annual graffiti festival out back. Uh, the Come and Go Theater is named after the gas station chain. Uh, they, were, they named the theater there. Uh, it's a fully functional black box theater with four resident theater companies. Uh, Malo Restaurant is our other for-profit tenant. It's a uh, Latin-inspired restaurant on the first floor of the firehouse. Um, we do circus and fire classes, which uh, I will say the ceilings are high enough in here today to do this, so I hope you're prepared for that. Um, in the basement of the theater, we have a live music venue. And then we have an outdoor venue between the two buildings that make up the campus of the social club. But the goal of what the social club was trying to do is, how do you build community through the arts? And we knew that this sounded nice and it's something that we wanted to do, but we weren't quite sure exactly how to do that. And so we figured this out completely by chance. And I'm going to tell a quick story because this story was the kernel for what the social club became and specifically for the work that I do today. So when we first opened, we didn't have the firehouse. We had this crumbling building uh, in downtown Des Moines. Downtown Des Moines has gone through a complete revitalization. When I moved there, where there were about 6,000 people living downtown. Today, we're approaching 15,000. And that's only in about 10 years. And, and of course, it's completely because of the social club. No. Um, but this was a building that we had in downtown. We got a two-year lease on this building. It was being held together by dirt. We loved every piece of that. Um, I'm sure you've heard of the caucuses in Des Moines. So prior to us having this, this was the Obama headquarters in 2008. That's why it has the yes, we can above there. Um, we got in there. We completely changed the space. And we built a makeshift art gallery, a makeshift theater, a makeshift bar and cabaret stage, and two makeshift classrooms. And makeshift is generous for what this actually became, because we had very little money. Uh, but the first group that ever came to rent our theater was a group called 3X Wrestling. And they do WWE style wrestling. And we never thought we'd have wrestling in our theater, but they had money, so we said yes. So they started renting our theater every first Friday to do their wrestling events. And as you might imagine, there are very specific types of people that come to see wrestling. On the same evening, totally coincidentally, in the bar, we booked a jazz and poetry night. <laughs> And as you might imagine, there are very specific types of people that come to see jazz and poetry. These two worlds would never be caught dead hanging out together, not once. So the first evening we did this, they came down the first Friday, the wrestlers went to the bar, got their drinks, ran to the theater, the poets went to the bar, they totally avoided each other. The second month, the same thing happened. But the third month, something really interesting happened, and this is the kernel for everything that I do today. 
So the wrestlers were on their intermission. They were running out to the bar and getting drinks and to running back, avoiding the poets because they're so scary. And the poets were avoiding the wrestlers as well, mostly because they're much larger than they are. And there were these two wrestlers standing about five feet away from me, drinking a beer and watching the poetry. And they suddenly turned to me and they said, hey, are you the guy who runs this place? And I said, yeah. And they asked if they could talk to me in private. I said, sure. We sat down in my office. I asked what I could do for them. They said, listen, we'd like to get more involved. I said, great. We're a nonprofit. Here's 10 different volunteer opportunities. They said, yeah, we had something else in mind. And they looked around to make sure nobody was listening. And they whispered, we both write poetry. <laughs> and they asked if they could read their poems at the club. And I said, well, sure, it's an open mic. Anybody can. And thus began our wrestling and poetry evenings. So the following month, these two very brave guys, they went, they watched the wrestling, they came out, they got on stage, they read their poems, which were actually pretty good, and they went back to wrestle some more. The following month, the people watching the wrestling came out to watch the poetry at first to support their friends, and then they kind of got into it. Two months later, the poets, encouraged by this behavior, said we should probably go check out what they do. They went into the theater to see what they're doing, and they walked out going, this is awesome. <laughs> Ten months in, we had to change the times of the program so people could go to both. Now, this was during the 08 caucuses. And the political conversations happening in that bar till 2 in the morning were some of the most natural, organic conversations, the things you dream about. People that are completely diametrically opposed on many different issues. Sitting there, civilly, having a beer, the beer helps, and <laughs> having a discussion about what they think. And it was all because there were two different events that brought them down and they began to form a community. And we stood back and we said, this is it. How do we replicate this every evening? And so today, the social club does at least two different events every night that try and attract as opposite crowds as possible. And that's why we have so many different things happening in the space. We'll do a pasta making class and we'll have a punk band. We'll have a Shakespeare performance and we'll have a uh, hip hop festival outside. And we have natural collisions of people that would never otherwise associate with each other. The funniest one, uh, when we first opened about three months in, we had two parents run into their teenage children. <laughs> and both sides were equally embarrassed. They were there for opposite events. But so really, to me, this is the work that I do now. I specifically work in rural communities. I do some work in urban, of course. But these are the two worlds of the Midwest. And to me, there's really no difference with this dichotomy with, than with wrestlers and poets. Two folks that have different walks of life, different demographics, but are thrust together at certain times and have to live with one another. So how do we work through that? How does creative placemaking play a role in that? And really it boils down to, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I started at McClure Engineering uh, about three months ago. Uh, my role there is as principal community planner, which means I principally plan communities. Um, I work with about 200 engineers. I am not an engineer, so please do not ask me any engineering questions. Uh, but the reason why I went to work for this company is because they're already laying the literal infrastructure of these communities. All the time, we work in 38 states around the country. And often, we're doing things like sewer infrastructure and different lighting in downtown and dealing with water and uh, aviation and all sorts of things. But to me, it starts first with asking the questions, what does your community want? What does it need? What's practical and how do you pay for it? And that's the work that I do now. And so we work hand in hand, and I'll talk a little bit later about why I went to McClure Engineering, specifically when we get into 3D printing, but we'll talk about that in a moment. So the old economic development model throughout the Midwest, certainly in Iowa, and I'm sure here as well, is when you have a small community, you want to attract jobs. So you want to attract companies. So you'll throw as many tax incentives and other types of incentives at companies as you can to get them to move to your town to create as many jobs as possible. And that's not a bad thing. But the problem is, is that it's now a zero-sum game. The incentives that every community of, re of any size has to offer is roughly the same as its neighbor next door or its neighbor four states over. So naturally, the, commu the, the companies that you're trying to attract are not only looking for dollars. They want a place where their employees want to live so they can attract talent, which is way more important to them. So it's not about the, getting the company. It's about making your downtown look like this and be as vibrant as possible. So how do we do that? First of all, every community I work in, these are the top two problems right away. Workforce development and housing stock. How many of you have those problems in your communities? I figured. So it's nice to get people to move to town to take a job, but if they have nowhere to live, why are they going to stick around? 
More importantly, if you're trying to attract a 25-year-old to move to your community, if your community is a rural area, more than likely they're not thinking in their minds they're going to stay there for the next 50 years of their life. They're saying, I'll be here for a couple years before I move on to the next thing in a larger metro, which I'm looking for. That means the likelihood of them taking out a 30-year mortgage is extremely low. They want a modern rental unit, and those virtually don't exist in many rural communities around the country. So that's step one. So moving beyond that, we have to create the unique. And when, this is the question I asked every community when I first get there. I say, what is unique about your town? Not what is unique about Little Rock versus another community in Arkansas. Not what's unique about Little Rock in Arkansas. Not what's unique about Little Rock in America. But what is unique about Little Rock globally? What is here and only here? Who came from here and went on to do something great? Who does things that are great and still lives here? I, often, we could tout people like yourself who are bakers and are doing something incredibly unique and uh, different for a community. That's what you have to begin to look at. And how do you find those people? How do you recognize those people? How do you motivate them and help them to stay and expand? That's unique. So specifically when we get to young people, and I, I, I divide folks into three different areas once you hit 18. There's 18 to 35, there's 35 to 50 or 55 depending on who I'm talking to, and then there's 50 or 55 and up. And what we've learned is that the two worlds of 18 to 35 and 50 and up, those folks essentially want the exact same things in their community, they just use them at different times of the day. It's the middle world that I'm in with young kids where we don't get to go out and enjoy anything, so it doesn't matter anyway. <laughs> it's the other two worlds that we're focused on. And so when you're trying to attract workforce to your community and you want the next generation of young people and you say, what do you want? More than likely, they're going to say these three things right off the bat. They're going to say, we want mountains. They're going to say, we want oceans. And they're going to say, we want a professional sports team. Now, unfortunately, those three things are not happening in rural communities anytime soon in the Midwest. So if that's the case, we have to move beyond those three things and enter these worlds. These are the five worlds that young people in particular, and, and folks 50 and up, are looking for in their communities. They want a cultural community. They want smart transportation. It doesn't necessarily mean public transportation. It means smart transportation. How do you get from here to there in the most efficient way possible? Uh, they want great parks and recreation. They want jobs, but jobs are no longer one, two, or three on the list. They're low. Most people are moving to communities now based on the uh, quality of life that community has before they even look for a job. When I graduated high school, I, or college rather, I moved to New York. Why? Because it's New York. I didn't have a job. I only knew a few people there. I moved there because it's New York. You know a mark of a great community is when people say, I moved to Little Rock. Why would you move to Little Rock? Did you get a job? No. Did you know somebody? No. Were you in a relationship? No. Are you from there? No. Why did you come here? Because it's cool. Because it's awesome. Because it's a place that I wanted to live. That's the mark of a community being strong economically. And lastly, they want an entrepreneurial culture. So exploring these, when you look at this list here, this is a list of, of amenities and things that Basically, communities of a million plus across the country, they have all of these things. Smaller communities uh, like Little Rock probably have some of these things. Rural communities tend to have very few of these things. And this is what young folks are looking for when you're trying to attract them to come to your town. So moving beyond that, I want to show you this graph, which is one of my favorites. This is uh, the uh, map of breweries from 1887 to 2013. I don't show this simply because drinking beer is fun. Uh, I show this because the brewery culture is one of the most entrepreneurial things happening, and when you put a brewery in your community, it, it naturally inspires so many other things to happen around it, not to mention the economic development that it puts out. But, so 2,500 breweries by 2013, which is pretty amazing. These are all microbreweries. But the real amazing thing here is today, or in 2016, that number doubled in just three years to over 5,000. And that's where we are today. This is a, an industry that shows no, world, uh, no chance of stopping. It's only tons of growth. And how do you work with them? Plus, the making of beer is incredibly localized. It has a wonderful community around it. There needs to be regulation, of course. But this is one of the things you can do in your community to help bring that along. One of the things we're doing in a small town called Jefferson that I'm working in now, they have a big culture of home brewers. 
and what we're trying to do is build a nonprofit co-op brewery where the home brewers are renting these casks on a monthly or bi-monthly basis. Now the only problem with that is we can't guarantee it's going to be any good, but hopefully one out of the ten is actually good. So that's uh, just a piece of an idea that you could do. So when you think about creatives and what artists are looking for, here's a list of things that you can build. It's not very expensive with the exception of fiber uh, that you can put into your community that young people are looking for. And last night when we were uh, at Ed's house uh, having dinner, it was a beautiful sunset on the river. It was a beautiful location. And I was saying to Mark that if you had, if you brought 50 artists from, uh, uh, let's say, Houston here right now and showed them this sunset and then showed them the home prices and showed them their commute times and showed them the quality of life that Little Rock has, I bet 15% of them move here right away. And it's just little things like that, especially if you have these amenities that they're looking for. So a couple of thoughts here. Um, in terms of residency programs to attract artists, this is one of the best ones in the country. This is the Bemis Center in downtown Omaha, in the Old Market District of Omaha, which is a very popular district uh, right in downtown. The Bemis Center bought this beautiful building about 40 years ago for next to nothing. And in the first floor, they built this contemporary art museum, and upstairs is the residency program. And here's how it works. Every three months, they choose 12 visual artists from around the world that, come to, that apply to be in the program. If they get in, they get to live upstairs for three months, free room and board. They get paid 750 bucks a month stipend. They get use of the facilities to make their work. And at the end of three months, they get to show their work in the, in the museum, and then they go home. And what do they do when they go home? They tell everybody how amazing Omaha is. But more importantly, this program has a seven-year international waiting list. There are artists right now in Paris that are applying to this program that are not going to get in for seven years in Omaha. It's not that difficult to do. It just takes people with vision. Doing this in your community, even in a town of 5,000 people, of 2,000 people, you can do. do. Start with two artists. And there's other things you can do besides artists, but that's a, a great way to attract folks to come. So a couple uh, projects that I worked on that I wanted to highlight in the past year, year and a half. So downtown Council Bluffs. Council Bluffs is across the river from Omaha. I call it the Brooklyn of Omaha, um, right on the western sh uh, shore of Iowa. Uh, Council Bluffs is uh, a growing community, but they had this issue. They had this building, the Harvester 2 building. It's about 70,000 square feet just off their downtown that's been sitting there for decades looking like this. Meanwhile, next door, its sister building, the Harvester 1, looks like this. And it was turned into, about 10 years ago, an artist loft residency program, similar to the one in Omaha. But this is where artists just live and work. They pay rent. It's a, a fairly normalized residency program. And it's been very effective. But the building next door hasn't been done. So they knew they wanted to create a cultural center. And so here's the idea. Uh, also, I should say, behind those two buildings, this is the land that's wide open, totally developable, right behind those buildings, nothing there. So they had that as going for them as well. What they were thinking is a cultural center that we're going to get the ballet there that's going to be great. We're going to get a theater company there. We'll have a small cafe. We'll have uh, residential units on the upper floors. And that'll be great. The problem with that is that young people, if you're trying to attract them, 25-year-olds tend to not really care much about the ballet, and they're not going to a community theater company. So how do you work together to get a larger demographic to come? And where we landed was this. After several uh, months of visioning sessions and workshops, this is what it's being turned into now. It went from an $8 million price tag to a $24 million price tag. Uh, I had nothing to do with that. Um, but this is what they're looking to put in there currently. The upper floors where they were going to put residential units now is going to become flexible rental space and flexible presentation space. They've got a full-scale restaurant that they're putting in. They're learning what they can do with the land surrounding it. They're going to be putting in commercial programs and residential there as opposed to in that building. And the whole thing is expanding. This is going to be a catalytic effect for Council Bluffs. And this is what it's going to look like when it's all said and done. The building, the brick building right there is the original building. They're going to build onto it to the south and build the theater and completely expand what they're trying to do. And this all happened because we went through the community and we talked to as many people in the community as possible. We said, what do you want? What are you missing? And this is what came up. Now in a smaller community, uh, I know it's a dark photo, I apologize. This is Earlham, Iowa. This town is a town of 1,400 people. It's about 30 minutes west of Des Moines, down Interstate 80. And nearly half of the community 
commutes to the Des Moines Metro every single day. And this building on the corner there is the Bricker Price building, and it was largely vacant for the past decade. Now, when you, we asked the community what do they want, they said, look, we got one restaurant. And it's a bar, and it's fine, but it's not a place I want to bring my children to, and we need another restaurant. And we said, what else? And they said, we need some residential units. And said, okay, we could put some on the second floor, but how could we do something else with that? And they said, you know, we have a lot of our teenagers, our juniors and seniors in high school, there's nothing to do here on Friday and Saturday night, so they drive to the metro, and then they drive home late, and parents are concerned about their safety. So how do we give them something to do here? And then they said, we also have a lot of kids that are interested in culinary. And how do we get, start a cooking program that could connect to the high school? So we took all this stuff together, and we crunched the numbers, and we figured out where we could land. What, what it's going to become is, on the second floor is going to be a culinary program that's attached to the high school. The first floor is going to be a fully functional restaurant. And also part of the second floor is going to become a teen center. And as you probably know, once you call something a teen center, it guarantees no teens will show up. So how do you solve that problem? We went to the high school and we said, OK, here's $20,000 out of our $2 million budget. Design it. You guys design it. What do you want it to be? Please call it something else other than a teen center. You choose the name. You design what it's going to be in there. Also, how do we teach them some business skills? And we say, how do you make this sustainable? So they decided that there needs to be a monthly, uh, basically, rent membership program that teenagers are using to use the space. And so that's going to break ground this fall. And we hope that's going to become a catalytic program for that community. Lastly, downtown Fort Dodge. Fort Dodge is a town of about 25,000 people, an hour and a half north of the Des Moines metro. Fort Dodge has uh, had, had 25,000 people for 100 years. And they always say, well, we haven't lost people. And we say, well, that's great. You also haven't gained. So it's held steady for a long time. It's got a lot going for it. But one of the biggest problems it has is this building. Right in downtown Fort Dodge, the Warden Hotel Plaza. This building is 260,000 square feet. It sits right in the middle of Fort Dodge, and it has been vacant for 25 years. And so an entire generation of people in Fort Dodge grew up, walked past this building every day, and said, that building is, looks how I feel about my town. Why would I stick around? So the city wanted to demolish it, knock it down. And then they learned, ooh, it's going to cost 5 to $6 million just to do that. So could we take that 5 or $6 million and apply it to actually reusing this building in some way? But what do we want to use it for? And so we started visioning sessions in the community. And these are the things that began, began to come up. They had a housing shortage just like everybody else. And they, we learned there's 33 nonprofit arts organizations in a 20-mile radius, only two of whom have a home. So that says, wow, we could do a cultural center. Great. They wanted to expand their recreation center, their YMCA. Great, that fits there. We got 260,000 square feet. We can do a lot of stuff. We can do a residential upstairs. We can put restaurants, retail, all these things. So sounds pretty cheap, right, to do this giant building. And where we landed is, oh, it's only going to cost about uh, $60 million. So easy. So we then we went to work and figuring out how do we get that $60 million. And this is where we landed. We knew that uh, historic state and federal credits could equal about 20 million, which is great. Brownfield credits, workforce credits, new market credits, altogether about six million dollars. Uh, the city is going to have to pass a bonding, and they were nervous about that. And then we did this last Halloween. They offered five dollar flashlight tours of the building, which was incredibly unsafe to do, um, <laughs> but they did it anyway. And they thought, well, maybe we'll get a couple hundred people in there, and it's going to raise money for their Fourth of July festival. In two days. They had 3,200 people come through. They raised $16,000 for what next month will hopefully be the best 4th of July festival ever. But more importantly, the mayor and council stood there and looked at all these people coming through and said, wow, that's 3,200 yes votes. Yeah, I feel pretty confident about passing this bonding. So then we learned we needed private equity, and we found uh, we're, we're, they're currently talking to different developers who are going to develop the upper six floors into residential units. But even if you do that, it still leaves an $8 million gap. So where does that $8 million come from? And what, we're, what we landed on is condoing the building, selling the first two floors to a nonprofit that's going to operate the cultural center and the recreation center. And that nonprofit has to go and raise that $8 million as opposed to borrowing it. And then we had to do a feasibility study to figure out, is that, is that money in that community? And the answer was yes. So that's how you redo a building of that magnitude and much smaller. Housing. Here's a wonderful house that has a tarp on the roof in an unnamed small town in Iowa. 
And this house rents for $800 a month with a tarp on the roof. We said, how, how could that be? How is that possible? And what we learned is there's three families that live in it. English is not their first language. They have no transportation. They worked at the plant that, the, uh, that uh, they walked to the plant that they work at just up the block. And then we said, well, where's the housing inspector to come and make a change here? And they said, we don't have a housing inspector. This is a community of about 3,500 people. And we said, so wait a second. Could we knock that house down, rebuild it, and charge $900 a month? Probably. And then we started looking at some other properties, this wonderful building down the street. And this is where I got this quote when I asked the chamber director what her economic development plan is. She said, I'm praying for a tornado. <laughs> but she said it like this, I'm praying for a tornado. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> That's her plan. So clearly something else has to be done there. So how do we address a housing problem like this? So the town of Newton is about 30 minutes the other direction in Des Moines, 30 minutes east of Des Moines. The town of Newton did a really innovative thing, and they're currently doing it now. They said, if you build a new home in the town of Newton that's worth over $160,000, here's what we're going to do. We're going to literally give you $10,000 to the home buyer. Most buyers use that as their down payment, or they can use it for whatever they want. They're going to buy them a year's worth of uh, tickets to the Iowa Speedway, which is in town. They buy them a year's membership at the YMCA, and they buy them a lawnmower. Pretty good deal. They've done over 20 of these in the last two years, and they're budgeted to keep doing more. And that's an innovative way that a community can incentivize people to want to move to that town and live there. But still, how do you keep them there is the other problem that's happening. So here's what I do. Essentially, we uh, go into a town. We do lots of visioning sessions to determine what the need is. Sometimes that's already been done. We don't want to replicate that, so we learn that research ahead of time. We begin to uh, look at specific buildings a lot. There's a lot of vacant buildings, typically in communities, or buildings that could have a better use, or there's empty land that we could utilize and develop. And once we do all that, we begin to figure out, OK, what goes in these buildings? So what, is it going to be a restaurant? Is it going to be a live music venue? Is it going to be a daycare facility? Is it going to be housing? Is it going to be a, a, a bakery, a dry cleaners? What is it that, needs, that the town needs? We will create those. Then we go and create a business plan for all of those uh, amenities that are going to be created. We find somebody locally who wants to own and or operate the business plan. Often, these are nonprofits that are created. We figure out if it's going to be viable. And then we figure out, OK, how much does it cost on the capital side to build? And whatever that amount is, we figure out where those dollars are going to come from. And then, if they want us to, we go and raise those dollars or find the investments for it. And then, if they want us to, we hire staff, we train them if they need it, we get the doors open, and then we go. We want a full, actionable plan. This is not a study that's going to sit on a shelf somewhere. How do we go into your community and take a building and bring it back to life? That's the goal. So uh, basically, I drive around the Midwest and find old buildings and think of fun things to put in them. This is an old brewery in Dubuque that they're turning into housing uh, next year. So the process is we go through visioning sessions, we create the business plans, we, get the, we figure out where the funding is going to come from, we train and hire if we need to, and then we actually implement and execute and get these things moving. Uh, here's vision sessions that we do. Uh, my boss said I had to put pictures in here of uh, visioning sessions. Here's a bunch of people sitting around a table. Uh, here's people putting dots on a wall. Um, but that's what the visioning sessions are. Um, here's where the money comes from. I believe wholeheartedly that all these projects have to be public and privately funded. Now, I also believe that most projects, I try to stay at a 10% threshold for public dollars. I don't believe taxpayers should be paying the majority or hardly any of this going up front, but probably some. Not always, but probably some. So I try to stay 10%, definitely no more than 20%, but if it's, only, if it's going to be viable, and if you're going to create an entity that's not going to come back to the community three years later and say, hey, we're broke, we need more money, we have to go up front and make it all, as much private investment as possible. And there's lots of ways to do that. Not just regular LLCs or for-profit companies. You have to have nonprofits, and you, we do both. Also, single-use concepts don't work anymore. You can't take a building and say, we're just going to do housing in it. You can't take a building and say, we're just going to put a restaurant in it. You can't take a building and say, we're going to just do retail. Or we're going to have a public building that's just going to be a library, or just going to be a city hall, or just going to be a police station. There has to be more uses than just one, because they have to play off of each other. At the social club, the restaurant on the first floor, what we learned is this. A third of the folks that come to that restaurant 
could care less about what the Des Moines Social Club does. They're there to eat lunch or dinner. But what we found is after their third engagement at that restaurant, they naturally engage in the, in the social club because they want to naturally explore it. So it's a gateway. So could you take a public building such as a city hall that needs to be rebuilt and you've got a full block of land that's not on the tax rolls, that is not putting money back into the community, and it needs to be rebuilt. And also, when you rebuild it, you're going to have to use public dollars to do it. So instead, why not have the city hall and a daycare center, or the city hall and a music venue, or the city hall and a, and a flexible education space, or recreation space, or community center? A lot of the things that Jack is doing uh, up at Eureka right now. These are the ideas that, to play with. Now you've got a program that is not 100% taxpayer funded, opens you up to lots of other ways to get the money, and you can put part of it back on the tax rolls. So whatever public investment you put in, you're gonna get back. That's the type of things that we try to do. So two ideas to share with you. Incentives programs, I've talked a little bit about this, of how do you incentivize things, and we love to incentivize companies, but then why are we not incentivizing people? So one example is in Fort Dodge, they had a problem of attracting and retaining high quality public school teachers. And you think about it, is a 23, 24 year old out of school that wants to be a teacher, they took the job in Fort Dodge because they didn't get a job in a larger metro. They're saying, I'm gonna be here for two or three years and then I'm out. And they're not living in a place they wanna live in because there's no modern rental units. So you're playing defense as soon as they show up. On top of that, the school district doesn't have the money to incentivize them, nor does the city. So here's what we do. In a program, in, or sorry, in a building, that let's say is a three-story building and it's $3 million. We're gonna make that building now $3 million and $40,000. And that $40,000 can be entirely private or come public-private lots of ways. But that 40 grand is enough to do four people a year for three years and here's how it works. If you agree to move to this community and become a teacher for three years, you gotta agree for three years, and you live in our building, which you're gonna to want to because it's the only modern rental unit, we're gonna do two things with those dollars. We're gonna underwrite your rent by $200 a month, and for every year you stay here, we're gonna pay down your student loans $1,000 a year. It's incredibly attractive for young people. In exchange for three years of working, living in our building, and we don't wanna give them free dollars, so we say dollar for dollar value, what we give you, you have to do community service hours. So we embed them in the community. And the hope is, at the end of three years, if 25% of those folks say, I kinda like it here, I think I'm gonna stay. They might buy a home. They might get married and have kids. In Iowa, every kid they have is $6,000 into the public school system. They're gonna shop locally. They might start a business. I would argue that, that initial $40,000 is a better return on investment than a, a $40 million tax dollar incentive that we can give to a company that may or may not create the jobs they say they will. Not that we shouldn't do that, but we can do this as well. And it doesn't have to be public school teachers. When I go to these communities, I say, what professions are you missing? Police officers, college professors, general contractors, plumbers, electricians, dentists, doctors. What does your community need? Let's go literally pay them to come here. And then becomes the work of getting them to stay. So that's idea number one. Idea number two, and I've talked a little bit about this, is the hybrid model for housing. Often developers are not going into rural communities because there's a gap in their funding to do a building. So again, in that three-story building that's $3 million, they might have a gap of half a million dollars to make it work because the money they're gonna collect in rent doesn't equal the cost to build. So why would they do it? So instead, condo that first floor, sell it to a nonprofit that we will create, could be a daycare center, restaurant, could be live music venue, any of the things that I've been talking about. That nonprofit has to raise that half a million to get it going, just like they're doing in Fort Dodge. Now that makes the developer whole. He, he or she can do the upstairs apartments that they want to do, and you get a new amenity that the community wants, all in one shot. That's the hybrid model for doing housing, and our company's beginning to do this now in small communities around the Midwest. So here's uh, some things that we do. I mentioned cultural assessments, amenity execution. The first four are basically the things that we're doing currently that I've been talking about. Um, we, and uh, where it goes into the assessments, we do visioning, we build this out so the community knows what to do, but again, it's not a study that's gonna sit on a shelf, it's an actionable plan that we want to execute. Uh, the amenities, this is a list of things that we're currently building right now, all throughout the Midwest, different concepts, different ideas for communities. Often, 
many of these things are in the same building working together. Uh, we will do the fundraising, we will find the investment, we've got experts in every single tax credit you could imagine uh, that are out there, which are, there are many, to how do you fund these programs on the capital side. Uh, development, we are doing that now with commercial properties, and, but mostly residential at the moment. Um, we, uh, the Forge partnerships are with a technology company to get them to come into town. Uh, 3D printing I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, we do educational programs. Uh, our CEO, Terry Lutz, has a wonderful program he calls No Mayor Left Behind, uh, where he works with small town mayors who may or may not have all the skills to do what they need to do, and how, how does that work. Um, we do training for artists and business owners. Uh, production, this is my own passion. Uh, we take uh, theater, theater performances, arts performances, literary performances, music performances. We tour them all over the Midwest to small venues all across the area, uh, uh, specifically in rural communities. Um, we do marketing. Every program that we create, every business that we create, comes with a fully realized marketing plan for it, so it actually, actually can stay viable. Um, and then I want to talk about this for a moment. Coastal living. When you, if you track the net migration of young people, which of course everybody does, of the east and west coast of our country, essentially if you're looking at somebody who's in their late 20s, early 30s, if they're a creative or an entrepreneur in any fashion, and they haven't quote unquote made it yet, meaning they're not a millionaire, which 99% of them are not, they are all actively looking to leave on the east or west coast. It is oversaturated, it is unaffordable, they can no longer be there or pioneer there, they are leaving. But they're not coming to Iowa, and they're not coming to Arkansas. So where are they going? More Arkansas than Iowa, actually. Here's a map from 2000 to 2007 of where young people went. In Iowa, that little pink dot there, I'm pretty sure that's me. <laughs> the rest of it's pretty white. Uh, Arkansas, you've got some development happening there, but not much. So where are they going? They're going to Minneapolis and Kansas City and Nashville and Austin and Denver. That's great. But those cities are going to become oversaturated, or you could argue they are already oversaturated. My definition of oversaturation in a community is, can you be 25 years old and find an affordable apartment in downtown? In Nashville, no way. Austin, not a chance, not for 20 years. Minneapolis, nope. Kansas City, maybe. Denver, probably not. So those cities are getting oversaturated. So where are they going to go next? They used to go to the coast. And what I'm, what I'm describing is the story of San Francisco 100 years ago. It's the story of Brooklyn, New York, 70 years ago. Brooklyn is now the fourth largest city in America, just Brooklyn. But that wasn't the case 40 years ago. So if, they, if that happens there, what can happen here? So my theory is this. Over the next five to 10 years, those are the cities that are going to become oversaturated that probably already are oversaturated. Now it's beginning to happen in places like Des Moines, Boise, Tulsa, here in Little Rock. We're seeing it begin to happen. And again, there's a different mark that you can use. We love to try, and I'm sure this is the discussion in Little Rockets, people that grow up here, that leave after high school or college, we want to get them to come back in their late 20s, early 30s, right, when they're ready to start a family, we want to get them back. And that's great. And you're probably having great success with that. But the real mark of if your community is successful, and I was talking about this in the beginning, is where's the kid that grows up in Chicago, that graduates from University of Chicago, and he says, I'm moving to Little Rock. I say, why? Because it's cool. Because it's fun. Because it has what I'm looking for from an amenity point. Do you have a job? No, I'll find one. That's the mark of a community that is strong. But still, 10 years from now, Little Rock and places like Des Moines are going to be oversaturated, which is hard to believe. And metro areas are going to expand. And places like this, here, Conway, is growing. That's going to become a new hotbed for folks if and only if they are creating the amenities that the next generation wants. If they're not, it's not going to work. They're going to get bypassed. And they're going to have to wait a whole other 50 to 100 year cycle for that to happen. So that's why small communities now need to start on this program. Take a look at these quotes for a minute. These are all about driverless cars and pilotless cars. Most folks are saying that by 2040, most Americans will use a driverless car instead of own their own vehicle. It's kind of hard to think about. So here's what one looks like. This is what I drove down in today. Um, <laughs> I'm joking. Um, this is a Mercedes. Uh, here's what it looks like inside. So you're going to be able to work while commuting. You're going to have full internet access. You're not going to be at the controls. You can work while commuting. 
also the tons of people are now telecommuting, working from where they live. So if that's the world that we're moving to, wouldn't that mean that somebody would say, wow, I could live in a town that's less expensive outside the metro, but still work in the metro? And they will, only if it has the amenities they want. If they can't go downstairs and get the groceries they want, or if they don't have a daycare facility for their kids, or if they don't have a restaurant to eat at, or live music to hear, or a nice street to walk down, they're not going to live there, no matter how much you pay them or how much the housing is. So driverless cars are going to have a whole big change on the way that rural communities work if we're open to that. So here's a map I made of, this is uh, central Iowa. The orange ring right in the middle there is the Des Moines metro. It's essentially a 45 minute ring around Des Moines. And most metro areas, there's a 45 minute ring around it. My prediction is by 2030, 2035, it's gonna be that blue ring, which goes out 90 minutes. And the reason why is because in, by 2035, it won't be a 90 minute commute anymore, it'll be a 60 minute commute because transportation is going to change. So when you're looking at economic development surrounding a metro area of whatever size, look for the communities that already have an interesting infrastructure, have something unique about them, and what can we do together to build the amenities that you know the next generation is looking for. Lastly, uh, check out this house. Do you notice anything odd about it other than the obnoxious color? Let's take a closer look. Anything weird about this house? This house was 3D printed in three hours. It's 3,000 square feet. And here's how it works. I've got a quick video here I want to show you. So this is how 3D printing buildings works. that blow your minds a little bit? It blew mine the first time I saw it. That's, that's hap Here's the interesting, interesting thing about 3D printing. That's happening right now. That house you just saw was printed in Siberia, Russia. These houses are being printed in Asia, all throughout Asia, a lot of China, the Middle East, Southern Africa. It's not being done in America. And the reason why is because codes and zoning are restrictive in urban areas going to take another decade or more to work through the codes in larger cities to get that done. Not to mention, if you can print 10 houses a week, there aren't enough housing inspectors to keep up with that. So if that's the case, my theory is for rural. If rural areas need new industry and new jobs and housing, could we leap over urban and grab a hold of this industry for a couple of reasons? First of all, if you, rural areas either don't have the codes at all, or if they do have the codes, they can be changed in about three city council meetings. Not every community, but many are willing to do this. I've got 12 communities right now that are willing to do this currently. 
We're just getting the technology. And this is why I went to work for an engineering company, because I'm not an engineer, and I need those folks to figure that out. But we can now print these homes. And I don't necessarily want to print single family homes. I want to print buildings. A few weeks ago in China, they printed a six story structure. It cost $180,000. It's going to change everything and how we do this work. It's also going to displace a lot of jobs, which is the other concern. So the blue collar jobs of tomorrow, a lot of folks are thinking, are going to be in coding. And that's how you print a building. You sit at a computer, you figure out what the code is, you design it that way. So if we are teaching kids now how to code, and we're teaching folks that are home builders now how to code, we're not just going to be printing buildings. There's a 3D printer sitting right behind that wall that you guys can check out that are printing all sorts of things. But they are, three, if, if, they are 3D printing right now hearts and lungs and pancreases. We're 3D printing food. We're 3D printing shoes. A building shouldn't be that hard, especially if it's a box. And this one works with synthetic concrete. It's that giant robot arm that spits it out based on how you code it. So a few things are happening here. If we embrace this in rural, we can jump over urban for no other reason than they can't do it right now because of the regulations. But rural can, if you have the right city leadership willing to take that risk. On top of that, it's going to create jobs. It's going to create the housing. And if we match it with an educational program that could be with a university or a community college or a high school, now we're doing training. So we can do all of that in rural communities. And this is exactly what I'm trying to set up right now in communities all throughout the Midwest. It solves the housing problem, it creates jobs, and it can have a, an incredible impact on the community financially. But also, how cool is it to say the first 3D printed house was done in X rural town in the middle of Arkansas? It'd be pretty amazing. So that's what we're trying, to, we're focusing on right now of how to do. And that, to me, is the heart of creative placemaking. Again, how do you create population growth and economic development through cultural and entrepreneurial ideas? The things I talked about are some of those ways, there's many others, and uh, we would love to come to your community and work with you on whatever projects you have going on or challenges you face. We have, we're, uh, we're working all throughout the country, and it'd be a pleasure to come back down here to Arkansas. I've had a great time while I've been here. So thank you so much. We need to think about how to get where our cities go in the next 30 years. That's the goal. Not where they go tomorrow, between now and 30 years from now. Thank you for your time this morning. It's been a real pleasure. OK. Um, wow. There are only a few times in my life I have been rendered speechless. I have been trying to figure out what to say. And all I've got is, wow. <laughs> that is a lot to take in. Thank, Thank you, you so much. I'll be days trying to process all of that presentation. But where people, I don't, oh, there it is. So your stay here previously in Arkansas was brief. We've got a special recognition we'd like to make. So if you'll come back. We'd like to present to you the Arkansas Traveler, which seems oh, wow. really apropos <laughs> for your situation. And just to give you a brief history of the Arkansas Traveler, come on down. Um, there are a lot of different urban legends, but this is the one we're going to go with for today. It's said to have begun in 1840 when Colonel Sanford Faulkner got lost in rural Arkansas and asked for directions at a humble log home. Faulkner, a national performer, turned the experience into entertainment for friends and acquaintances. When the traveler offered to pay the second half of the tune that the squatter was playing on his fiddle, or the Arkansas traveler, the squatter extended his hospitality to the traveler. When the traveler again asked directions, the squatter offered them, but suggested that the traveler would be lucky to make it back to the cottage, where you can come and play that tune as long as you please. So as a recipient of the Arkansas Traveler Award signed by Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson, wow. you are now an ambassador from Arkansas Wow! with the responsibility to spread the goodwill of Arkansas wherever you travel. So, thank you very thank much. Thank you once again. Thank you. Wow. Can we step over here? Oh, sorry. 
Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. We give you the option to take it now or we could ship it to you, whichever is easier. Uh, shipping might be easier. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you once again. Thank you very much. I think you'll be making a lot of visits. Sorry, I hope so. Thank you very much. You. Did you want to do Q&A or are we moving on? Sure. If there's any questions real quick, I can. Yes. Mm -hmm. What is that? Community 360 is how is we're basically we're branding this now. How do we come into a community and solve every single issue you have other than personal? Um, so we have teams that we put together that will come in and do your sewer infrastructure, build your restaurants, build your housing, everything. It's not just McClure. It's it's uh, architecture firms and other. We, we ask the, what we do ahead of time, we ask the community to put together, depending on its size, typically we do uh, about uh, 20 to 30 people at a time. Uh, they take 90 minutes to do, and we say we want uh, community leaders, we want elected officials, we want business leaders, we want entrepreneurs, we want students, we want artists, people of all demographics, and then we say mix them up into groups. And they decide who those folks are and then we run the visioning. And then often there's public ones where anybody can come to do that because we want to get as much buy-in as possible. You're welcome. Yes. Oh, sure, I think, yeah, they're gonna share it all out, the whole presentation, yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm leaving some business cards up here uh, if anybody wants to get in touch with me. Um, so if you have further questions, just let me know. Okay, yes. we've got time for one or two more questions. Yes, in the back. We need to, so from the question was about road infrastructure. You got to build your communities based on what they were built for. So public transportation is a big thing uh, communities want to do. Urban areas are moving to more towards that can't aren't big enough or can't afford light rail. Light rail is the sort of uh, gold standard, but it's extremely expensive. Uh, so they're more doing BRT, which is bus rapid transit, which are buses that move like trains. So there's dedicated areas on the, on the streets for the buses to come to, elevated platforms. They come every 10 to 15 minutes on cycles. Uh, full Wi-Fi capabilities on there is another great way to do it. But a lot of cities can't do that. A lot of small communities can't do that. So. When we look towards the future of transportation, I think, if, especially if you're a rural community, how do you go and, and do things that are probably not going to happen in that community for at least 10 more years, which is going to get di difficult to get the taxpayers to say, why are we paying for this now? Things like charging stations, things like roads that can, that can support different vehicles. But the things you can do right away are things called complete streets programs, where you shrink the streets. Most American streets are way too wide. And also, you don't want one ways, you want two ways. You also want to slow down the miles per hour that the cars are driving. The idea, especially in downtowns, are uh, most downtowns uh, have been designed where you get people in as quickly as possible and get them out as quickly as possible if they live in the suburbs. Changing that, how do you get people to slow down so they're actually seeing the businesses that you're driving past, which makes entrepreneurs want to open up in that area. Plus, it comes with citywide beautification, bicycle lanes, protected lanes. It goes on and on and on. But complete streets programs, it's something that we do. Uh, a lot of different companies do that. But it's something rural communities can do right away to make a change in transportation.